Hi everybody, it's Dr. B, and today I have a very special guest, Dr. Peter Coleman from the Coleman Institute. And today we're going to talk about an interesting topic, something you don't hear much on my channel, and we're going to have a wonderful insight into this. We're going to do naltroxone as medication-assisted treatment versus suboxone. So Dr. Coleman comes to us from Richmond, Virginia, yeah. and we've known each other for two to three years. And a little background on him from my end, uh, he's the founder uh, and the medical director of the Coleman Institute, and he's been doing this for quite some time. And now they've sort of been absorbed in by Baymark Health Services, which is uh, quite a large organization, and I know them well. They're a wonderful organization. They work in the substance abuse space. Is that correct? Yeah. So uh, before we get into some, some of the details of what we want to talk about today, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your history, and how sure. all of this kind of came about, Dr. Coleman? Sure. Well, I'm uh, a physician originally from New Zealand, and I uh, went to medical school over there. And then came over to America in 1983 as a family practice resident uh, in Virginia. Uh, but I was already suffering from an addiction problem myself. So I was heavy into drinking and then using other drugs like cocaine. And then I got into opioids. And in October 28, 84, I had an overdose and I was forced to go into treatment. And I didn't know anything about addiction at the time. I certainly didn't think I had a problem. I was convinced I was just a bit of a risk taker and, you know, someone who liked excitement, but I certainly didn't think I had a, an alcohol or a drug problem. But the Board of Medicine forced me to go to treatment for four and a half months. And during that time, I came to see that really I'd been suffering badly for a long time, very depressed. And, and I realized I came from an alcoholic family with my mom being an alcoholic and my uncle and, you know, his daughter died of a suicide because he was a pretty bad alcoholic and my brother's alcoholic. So I started learning all about addiction. I realized that's what I wanted to specialize in once I was through. So now, then I did a fellowship in addiction medicine and I've been working in the field for 34 years. So, uh, and sort of just dedicated my time to helping people get clean and sober. So it's been a fabulous journey. Um, and then part of that is the opioid crisis. You know, back in the late nineties, we started seeing a lot of people starting to use heroin that was at that time coming in from Colombia, very potent, a lot of people dying. And when you look at success rates with uh, heroin and other opiates, it's horrible. I mean, unless they use some form of medication assisted treatment, almost everybody relapses. You know, you see people go to jail for, you know, three months or six months or six years. And if they don't get treatment, they, as soon as they get out, they're back using again. It makes no sense. Uh, and there's a lot of overdoses and deaths. So it was a big need. And so I thought, well, what can you do? And then I, I realized that naltrexone is a drug that's been out for since about 1982 as a tablet. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work well as a tablet because people just take it for one day and then they can get high the next day. So then I heard about this implant. So you could put this implant and sew it into the person's uh, subcutaneous, their fat tissue. This is the early stomach. 90s, correct? 98. 98. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. and, um, and then it would last six to eight weeks. The ones we use now last eight weeks. So as soon as you put it in, people are like, wow, my cravings have gone. I, yeah, because they're, they're, their opiate receptors are blocked by the naltrexone. They can't get high even if they try. A lot of them try, but they yeah. can't get high. And they love it because their cravings are gone. They're like, I got my life back. This is amazing. So that's what we started doing. So we've been doing that for 21 years now. Um, the big challenge is how we get them detoxed, how you, you've got to get keep people completely to, you know, no drugs to completely detox before you can put them on naltrexone. And so that's where we've developed this accelerated detox that you're now working with and sure. providing that in Orange County. And you know, just to say we decided we need, we, well, we had a doctor here, Dr. Zarat uh, was uh, uh, out here. Unfortunately, he died of cancer, so we needed to find another doctor, and that's when we came across you. Uh, you know, we interviewed about seven or ten doctors, and, you know, you rose to the top as the guy that we wanted to work with. So, uh, and, you know, it's been a great relationship ever since, you know, providing the treatment that we've developed out here. Uh, yeah, so I, that's kind of what we do. I feel the same way about you guys. I just want to go back to when you first started doing this. So in the late 90s, you're like, you know what? I can use naltroxone. Yeah. And uh, 
And then you started considering the issue of, well, how do I get them to the place where I put this implant yes. in? And you weren't happy with the fact that they can take the 50 milligram pill every day. I think it's 50 milligrams. It is yeah, 50 it milligrams. Is, yeah. And so you wanted something a little bit more uh, stable and uh, holds them kind of accountable to their choices, at least in the early stages. What were you doing in the beginning? Were you telling them to, hey, stay clean for a few days and come and we'll do an implant? And how was how did that develop? Because yeah. uh, I'm familiar with your me my method and I know there's proprietary issues and I love it for the right patients that we yeah, choose. Yeah. It's fat. I mean, uh, I'd like to think it's me, but I've gotten so good at it. You know, I've had a few methadone guys that they're like, this was it. This is this is kind right. of a joke. And I'm like, well, right. I'm really good at it. And I'm just kind of joking. I'm like, I might be better at it than everybody out there except Dr. Coleman. But uh, it's a wonderful way you you approach it. And uh, But in the beginning, what were you doing where he's telling people, hey, stay clean for a few days and I'll come and, and then we, come we, back? We, we tried that and no one could do it, you know. Uh, and so we had to develop a way of actually getting people off all the opioids. And so the way I look at it is people come in, they've got the drug sitting on their receptor. When they come in to see us, they've got a pretty high level and they've got to get to zero before you can put them on naltrexone. Because it, as soon as you put them on naltrexone, they're going to go straight to zero in five minutes. And so instead of a 10 day withdrawal period, they're going to zero in five minutes. It's horribly traumatic for the body. So for the first three years, I did the, the uh, um, anesthesia detox where I would hire an anesthesiologist. We'd put them to sleep for four hours. Wow. Yeah, put a, naso, put a tube down into their stomach, crush up naltrexone, you know, give it to them, and you'd watch their body go through this horrible withdrawal. But they were asleep, so they didn't care. The problem is they woke up and they still felt horrible. They hadn't recovered. You know, all the drugs were gone off their receptors. They were clean but their body and their brain hadn't healed yet. So it was like a horrible next few days where they would be confused and delirious and out of touch with reality and agitated and dangerous, frankly. So and there's all the dangers associated with actually going through the procedure of anesthesia, whether exactly, it's all the side effects, exactly. losing so airway, then, the drugs, That's right. So in 2002, I, I learned from Australian doctors some techniques of how they do it, and I combined some things I'd been doing, and we came up with this outpatient procedure, no anesthesia, spread it out over three or four days, but still get almost 100%. We still get 97% success rate. And like you said, we were talking to some insurance executives in, in Boston last week, and you know they're going to start covering our program. And I was like, we've gotten really good at it, you know, so, so we know exactly how much medicine to give of this kind and this kind yeah. to get them to zero. And the patients are usually like you said, you know, that's it. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Not for everybody. I mean, you know, it's, it's tough for some people, you know, some people genetically just seem to be more set up to have a tougher withdrawal than others. Yeah. And we'll get a yeah. little more into that. It's interesting. I want to note uh, how I, I came into contact with Dr. Coleman, uh, a lot of you know I operate in Orange County, and uh, I think the industry of treatment here uh, could be better. I mean, let's leave it at that. So I have always operated in my own small bubble and space, and I don't really work with uh, anybody else, whether it's physicians, treatment facilities, detox programs, and so forth. And... Uh, Dr. Coleman didn't reach out to me at first. It was through a business contact or associate. They were reaching out to me and they're like, hey, the Coleman Institute's kind of reaching out to you. And they sent me a couple of emails and a, and a yeah, letter, I think. And I just kind of threw it away, right? Because I really kind of... That was, was us. Yeah, yeah I yeah. was very turned off yeah. because I had just left the university and I was very turned off by what I was seeing down here. And then you called and I was like, wow, that's kind of interesting, you know? And you're like, we're coming out there. And I'm like, sure, you know, we can meet and... I was so impressed with uh, uh, the professionalism, uh, the knowledge base, uh, the integrity with you. And you came out with Gene and Andrew, I believe, Andrew yeah. Blake. And I was so impressed uh, because my kind of, you know, I kind of have blinders on to a certain extent for the most part. And we'll get into this with maintenance, treatment, being suboxone and so forth. But I was so impressed with you guys, and I've now, I'm very happy about having moved forward with this. Mm -hmm. So that's how our relationship originally began. Uh, let's talk about patient selection, if we can. Sure. Uh, I have my own experience with it, so I have some thoughts on it. And I've noted that 
uh, you guys sort of push this as medication-assisted treatment. I do know SAMHSA, the sort of ruling body that is, you know, uh, sort of the head honcho on all of these issues, the professional body, medication-assisted treatment. They also call naltroxone medication-assisted treatment. Tell me your thoughts on that and uh, what, what, what you really, uh, you know, can you expand on that for me a little sure. bit? <clears throat> yeah, like I said earlier, without any form of MAT, almost nobody stays clean and sober. I mean, there have been studies going back 40, 50 years, even where you put people on a farm in like Tennessee or something, yeah. and as soon as they got out, they were back using. You know, you put them in jail for six years and they're back using as soon as they get out. The addiction is so strong that, for opioids especially, I mean, yeah. this, uh, there was a program that I r was working with in the early 90s, and uh, we looked at our alcohol patients, and they had about a 70% success rate doing an IOP, right, intensive outpatient program. When we looked at our opioid patients, zero. Not one person even completed the program, let alone stayed sober. So that's what you're up against with opioids. There's something about the way they work in the brain, the strength of how good they feel, how long the memories and the cravings and the, and the desire to use just a little bit stays, you know, that it's almost impossible for people to not resist, you know, to resist it without some form of medication-assisted treatment. So that's why methadone came out in the 70s, you know, but people don't really like being on methadone. They prefer not to be. And Suboxone wasn't available when I started. So it was really methadone or nothing, which didn't work. So when I, when I heard about these naltrexone implants as a medication-assisted treatment, it was like, that's perfect. It's non-addictive. There's no withdrawal. You don't have to get off of it. You don't have to go through any withdrawal when you're finished. It completely blocks the cravings. The only question is how, how can you give it to somebody so it lasts long enough that it will do some good because we knew that once a day tablets just didn't work. People didn't take them. And I've actually got some ideas about why that works. It turns out cravings for a drug have a lot to do with access to the drug. Mm -hmm. So when you put an implant in or Vivitrol, which is the other form of, the uh, of naltrexone long acting, there's no, there's no accessibility to the heroin anymore because you can't get high even if you use two or three grams of heroin. And so people know that, and so they stop thinking about it. It's like if you're trying to quit smoking, and you're on a retreat, and there's no cigarettes anywhere around for a whole week. You stop thinking about cigarettes. You know, as soon as you come back to town, you start thinking, should I have one? Because there's access to it. When people take the oral tablet, it's just one day, and they know it. And so their brain is already thinking, I could get high tomorrow. I'm not going to, but I could. And so when I've had patients say when they unscrew the, bot, the cap, it's actually reminding them that they could get high. That's completely different than a Vivitrol shot where for a month you're done. With an implant, two months you're done. They love it. Patients just have no cravings. The key then is keeping them on it long enough for their brain to go back to normal mm -hmm. and for their behaviors to change so that they can learn what real recovery is really about. Because I hate to say it, most people want a shortcut. Most people just want the problem to be gone and done with. And it's naive. It's immature. It's, it doesn't work that way. You know, people have addiction. Most people, we think, have addiction because of a genetic vulnerability in the brain. And then once they use drugs of some kind or another, it kicks off that disease. And that disease remembers. And it stays there for the rest of your life. So you've got to work at your recovery for the rest of your life. You've got to stay away from vulnerable situations. You've got to not put poisons in your brain that might kick the addiction back in. And people need to learn that. That doesn't happen overnight. You can't learn any new skill. You know, how long do you go to med school? You don't get to be a doctor by just saying, I want to be a doctor. You have to go to med school and study and learn and change. Sure. So people, you know, people have to learn that. So we're recommending everybody stay on Naltrex and MAT for at least a year. Some people aren't ready for that level of commitment to their recovery. They don't really want to stop that much. They, want, they, don't, want, they don't want the craziness of the heroin. They're better off, but, but they don't really want to stop completely. They want to keep the options open to still do a little cocaine on the weekends or do some ecstasy here and there or still smoke pot or still drink on the weekends and stuff. Those aren't really good candidates for naltrexone MAT. They're better for suboxone because 
Because if they mess up, or when they mess up, and a lot of people even plan it, they're not going to die of an overdose. They're going to be able to get back on the Suboxone, you know. So you see people in your practice, and I'm, I'm treating some patients with Suboxone, they'll, they'll take the Suboxone, and then they'll use heroin on the weekends. They'll stop for a day or two so they can still get high again. Sure. Those aren't good candidates for naltrexone. So, so they're better off to stay on their suboxone until they grow up a little bit and they realize what do they want out of life. You know, they want to be happy. They want to be stable. They want to actually have people who love them and they want to feel good about themselves. Suboxone can help people grow like that sure. if they stay with it. And then they're good candidates to switch to naltrexone. So that's, that's a big part of our business now is getting people along their recovery journey, they've maybe used methadone for a few years or suboxone for a while, and now they're ready to give it all up and just be on naltrexone. So that's kind of where I see it. In fact, uh, I try to follow uh, your patients, the ones that I, I, I do the procedure on, yeah. uh, as much as I can. And some of the most uh, uh, wonderful successful stories I've had is guys being on years of methadone. And you should see the text I get that yeah. uh, one of them, uh, his father had me call in and leave a message on his birthday. Oh, I'm sorry, one year rec uh, so sobriety. Right, right. And the surprise was, you know, uh, right, right. calling him in. But I've had three of uh, your clients uh, that have been long-term methadone users and this was uh, have now switched to all, the naltrexone, and, 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 yeah. and, and one of them were going on over a year. Yeah. Another one were on four to five months. Another yeah. one were in seven, eight months. They're doing wonderfully. Yeah, um, it's very gratifying because it, yeah, and and those are good candidates for our program because they've got the stability on the methadone, and now they don't need it anymore. And when what we do with our accelerated detoxes, we can get the methadone out in eight days instead of having to wean down over. 18 months, which, yeah. you know, is what usually happens. And frankly, most people fail, you know, they try weaning down and then it's just too painful. So they go back up and yeah. So you are definitely, because, you know, the, it's, a, it's such a topic of controversy in North America, at least you are not against Suboxone or that kind of uh, medication. No, not at it, all. Yeah. No, I think it's all about patient selection. Exactly. You exactly. know, you need to meet the patient where they're at no different than any other medical disease we treat. I mean, if you've got a diabetic, you know, you've got to figure, is this a person who's good for insulin or are they best for metformin or for... Some people only need diet and exercise and that's that's all they need. You've got to tailor it. Same with cancer treatment, any treatment. Good. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree 100%. And you mentioned something I often say, meet the patient where they're at. And for me, that's an expression of harm reduction. Uh, you meet them where yeah. they're at. Like you said, the guy yeah. that's yeah, using... You know, yeah. I myself... Don't turn, you know, in a lot of practices in town, if you test, uh, I don't use the word dirty, I use positive for urine. Sure. If you test positive yeah. for urine, you're fired from the practice. Right. I do not do that. Sure. It's just now you have to see me every week. And right. I like that. I noticed right, you right, said right. meet the patient where they're at. Yeah. The other thing I want to talk about, this whole patient selection criteria, exclusion and inclusion criteria, uh, you've spoken to it quite a bit. I have found in my practice, almost by virtue of the fact that the patient is in a stable enough environment where they can sort of reach you guys, uh, get everything resources together in terms of the loved one that has to come and be with them, follow directions. They're already at a place where there's enough cognitive uh, evolution after the substance abuse or with the substance abuse that they almost... Uh, include themselves in that selection cr uh, criteria. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, a lot of a lot of other doctors will say, "How can you work with drug addicts and heroin addicts?" And because they're used to seeing these people uh, in the emergency room or passed out on the street with an overdose, and you know they never listen to what you say, they never you know do what you tell them to do. And I say, well, we're look, we're getting people at the point they're ready to change. You know, we're getting ready. For, we're getting people who have already found us on a website. They've already called us. Yeah. They've already mentally figured, I'm sick of the life that I had, and I really want to change. They don't understand quite what's involved and how difficult it's going to be, but they're eager and they're, and they're willing to at least try something different, and their family exactly is involved as well because the families suffer 
just as much, if not more, than sometimes the the patient does. I mean, you know, it's horrible, as you've seen with, yeah. you know, the pa- the families are like they're going to bed every night wondering if their kid is going to be alive tomorrow because they're shooting up fentanyl now, and it's horrible. So they come to us, they're ready to change, and then they're incredibly grateful because we get it over with really quickly. Yeah. I mean, in four days, they're done. They're finished, you know, and yeah, they don't feel great. There's still a little insomnia and stuff like that to work through. But there's an end in sight. And so people like that, you know. And then, like you said, we get so many patients who are so grateful and so happy, like two months later, six months later, you know, that they've got a new life and that, that, you know, that they're not going out and using heroin every day. It really is very gratifying. So it's a pleasure working with these people, especially when you when you accept it as a disease that the people, if it's a genetic illness that nobody wanted to have in the first place, they just fell into it because of bad, you know, bad genes, really. I mean, almost everybody tried using some drugs when they were teenagers, but most people didn't like it that much. But people with the, gene, with the disease of addiction, they did like it. Their brain got activated by that process, by that dopamine surge. And, uh, and then they kept going and ended up, you know, with all these problems. So they're so grateful when you treat them with respect and, and you know, and recognize that it's not their fault and that they're on the same team as you are just trying to get out of this hole. So I agree completely. Yeah. Any thoughts or any recommendations? Uh, what do you think about post-procedure uh, 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 treatment intervention of any sure. kind, psychosocial or medical? Yeah. Uh, what is it that you recommend to patients? Sure. I, you know, I, I have my own little thing, which is not yeah. different than yours. but uh, Yeah, just... so... So it's it's not actually rocket science. It's pretty yeah. straightforward. You know, there's a there's a doctor Robert Dupont who has studied doctors who went through a rehab kind of like I did. The success rate is about ninety two percent five year success, whether they were on opiates, heroin, fentanyl, alcohol, cocaine, whatever it was. For doctors, yeah, phenomenal success rate. And when you look at this, the 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 the, the features of that program, which Frankly, I wish everybody could get that program because 92% success rate is phenomenal. In fact, it was about 78% with, with no slip-ups and then another 16-odd percent with, um, with one short relapse and then five years after that. Um, so the tr- so what, what they find is that it's extended treatment up front. So you know, usually three or four months of pretty intensive therapy, which can be an IOP, it's particularly good if they live in a halfway house where there's a lot of structure and stuff like that so they don't mess up. Um, there's complete abstinence. So it's a program where there's no alcohol, no pot, no addictive drugs going in the brain, just substituting one for another. So it's, it's accepting the fact that you've got the disease of addiction. You're not just a cocaine addict or an alcoholic. You've got this chemical dependency problem that you need to be off of everything and learn how to live there's, a, there's intensive therapy, there's, and then there's follow-up with urine drug screens and uh, stuff like that. So, so, and almost everybody had to go to like some kind of support group like 12-step AA or NA or you know, smart recovery or something like that. So really, it's good treatment up front, abstinence-based model and support groups and some ongoing therapy. Because at the end of the day, you have to get the chemicals out of your brain and you have to learn how to be happy. You know, most people use drugs because they kind of want to be happy, you know, Mm -hmm. and they think the drugs kind of give it to them. Oh, I don't feel as shy or as nervous or whatever. You know, my life's exciting. You've got to find those things in recovery without putting some chemical in. And it just takes time to do that. So you are... uh you're not dismissing the importance of that psychosocial intervention and oh, long-term recovery. It's, it's essential. You do the procedure. You've got to learn yeah, how absolutely. to be happy. That's That doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen just because you want it to happen. It happens because you do the work yeah, of recovery. Of work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what we have here is basically we're using naltroxone as a medication-assisted treatment intervention, as a pharmacological intervention. We're making the detox in the initial stages when people are ready and by the way, I do know that uh, this is just for all opiates across the board. And we, I think we also do um, for even Suboxone when someone's sure. having a hard yeah. time with Suboxone, methadone. And I also know we do this for alcohol, a little tweak on the procedure. Sure. And there's a benzo procedure, which I'm not too familiar with, yeah. but that's a whole different discussion. So what we do here, what, what, you got, what you've kind of come up with is a way where up front, all the opiates are cleaned out of your system. Quickly and, and safely and Quickly, safely under a doctor's yeah, yeah. Uh, supervision. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, and comfortably. We're doing yeah. using sort of comfort medication. And successfully. I mean, we, we really do have 97% of people start the program this. and get on naltrexone, which is, yeah. is phenomenal. Really, the only people that don't do that are, are kids who didn't really want it anyway. You know, their parents wanted them to do it, and they're like, And no. I've had a couple of those, yeah. and I actually recommend they don't do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, they're, they're better for suboxone until yeah. they grow up a bit. Yeah. Um, tell us how uh, – so I do know that the – home office or the home uh, medical clinic is in Virginia. I do know yeah. you have, what, 11, 12 locations across yeah. the country? Yeah, and, yeah, and that's been fun. Uh, yeah, we've, we've been able to teach doctors like yourself in different parts of the country uh, how to do the procedure, and then we support them. We have a call center where people can uh, call and learn about, you know, how the procedure works, what's involved, uh, and all the details and stuff like that. And then once then they call you and, you know, once they know that they want to do it, then uh, they'll call you before they even start the procedure and you'll review the whole history with them over the phone to make sure they are a good candidate and that there's no kind of red flags, you know, that we might need to tweak things a little bit. Sometimes we'll extend the detox out another day or two, uh, you know, if there's a huge amount or if they're using huge amounts of fentanyl or they recently used methadone or suboxone, something like that. And I love that about you guys because there's a lot of professional integrity here. Yeah. Uh, one of the things, as uh, uh, some of you guys might know, I'm very much a control freak on right. who comes through my doors and what, what I do with patients. I was always like that even when I was at the university. And I love that latitude. It's the patient eventually comes to me. I get to review the case and yeah. I make my decision. Yeah. And I love the fact that there's so much flexibility. You know, sometimes I get a methadone patient and whatever it is, they've signed up for a seven or eight day program. I will extend yeah. nine or yeah. 10 days sure. and you guys are great with that. So I love that. Yeah. And, and it's been working It's all out. about getting the patient where they want to be. Exactly. Which is clean and sober. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so this is Dr. Peter Coleman. With the Coleman Institute, I do work with them. And, uh, you know, my, my viewers that know me out there, I'm pretty selective about who I deal and work with. It's really been a pleasure the last couple of years because for me, it's been sort of uh, another perspective on treating the patients suffering from addiction. And it gives me one more piece of the arsenal to be able to offer to them. So in that way, it's been wonderful for me as well. Uh, no. uh, Dr. Coleman, thank you so much yeah. for joining me today. Yeah. I know you came all the way from Virginia. Uh, I know you did some surfing. Did you enjoy that? <laughs> it uh, was fabulous. Yeah. You did? Okay. Well, uh, I'm glad you enjoyed that. I tried and out a new carbon fiber board that's really light and uh, much easier to use. So it was really fun. And you do that paddle surfing yeah, kind yeah. of thing, right? Yeah. Or whatever to help. Wonderful. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Just click on the button above here, ring the bell, and thank you again. We have reached 1,000 subscribers.